Hello and welcome to EGM 702 Photogrammetry and Advanced Image Analysis. This is week 2, part 5, Where to Find DEMs. We're currently in a bit of a golden age of satellite data. We have a number of different data sets that are freely available that you can go and find images uh, for anywhere on the Earth um, over a very long period of time. We also have a number of high-resolution satellite, uh, satellite sensors that are requiring images in stereo, uh, which allow us to calculate topography. Uh, so we have the different worldview uh, satellites and the GOI, which are all part of the Digital Globe constellation. Uh, we also have Pleiad data, um, ALOS Prism, uh, both 1 and 2, as well as different spot sensors and Aster. So we have a number of different options for um, going out and actually calculating DEMs using satellite images. But not only do we have that, we also have a number of different global DEM products that we'll talk a bit more about in this lesson. Uh, the first of these is the Shuttle Radar Topography Mission, or SRTM. Um, this was acquired using a C-band and an X-band radar which means that there is some penetration of the signal into the snow, vegetation, and other surfaces that you need to take into account when you're using the SRTM data. Um, but this is a, a very good uh, global product um, that you can use for lots of different applications. Um, this was acquired uh, using instruments aboard the Space Shuttle Endeavour in February 2000. The C-band radar uh, covers all land masses between about 50 to 4 degrees south and 60 degrees north. The X-band radar covers much of the same uh, latitude extent, but it is not complete. It's, um, it was, there were fewer acquisitions of the X-band, um, and so there's, there's less data coverage, but there's still quite a bit. Uh, this is all available at 30 meters global resolution, um, and the uh, C-band radar, at least, is available via Earth Explorer um, from the USGS, as well as uh, having been ingested into Google, Google Earth Engine. Um, I've mentioned ASTER already. This is the Advanced Spaceborne Thermal Emission and Reflection Radiometer. Um, this was a joint, or is a joint, NASA and Japanese Space Agency venture. Uh, that was launched in December 1999 aboard NASA's Terra satellite. And you can see what Terra looks like in this, uh, in this image here, as well as what the acquisition geometry of the Aster um, stereo camera looks like. So this is a number of different systems. We have the visible and near-infrared um, that are bands 1, 2, and 3. Here uh, we also have a shortwave infrared system at 30 meters resolution, uh, at least until 2008 when the system stopped functioning, and we have a number of bands in the thermal infrared uh, as well as the, uh, the other bands. And I mentioned that this acquires in stereo images, which means that we can extract topography from it. Uh, the camera is arranged in a way that we have a BH ratio of 0.6, which if you remember from the photogrammetry lectures last week, that's uh, at the lower end of where we can expect to see accurate DEMs. So it's not as good as it could be, but it's still extremely good, uh, especially given the, the long history of acquisitions for this, for this sensor. So we have a nadir camera um, looking straight down in band three, which is in the near infrared, as well as a backwards looking band um, that is also in, in the same wavelength range. Um, and it's acquiring the same spot on the Earth about 60 seconds after, um, after the nadir camera looks at it. So uh, if you have very fast motion, for example, river ice, you can actually calculate uh, things like, uh, like flow speed from these images as well. Uh, and from April 2016, the entire Aster archive is now freely available, uh, which gives us an amazing 20-year time series of global elevation as well as elevation change that we can use for a number of different applications. Um, 
It is not without its problems, however. So we have sensor pointing errors, which lead to significant bias in both the along track, so in the direction of satellite motion, as well as cross track or across the direction of satellite motion uh, directions. So we get errors of up to 20 meters as a result of these pointing errors. These are errors in the orientation of the sensor. Um, and you can think back to the, to the lectures on photogrammetry as well as the DEM accuracy analysis to think about how errors in your, um, in your sensor orientation lead to errors in your topography extraction. Fortunately, because these are systemic errors, we are able to um, compare them to external data and model and then correct that. Um, we can model and then correct those errors, um, at least to a certain extent. And so you see an example of this here, where we have the Aster DEM compared to a very high resolution, high accuracy uh, DEM for an area somewhere in Alaska. Um, you can see the elevation differences have a very clear spatial pattern. You see areas of, um, you see what that looks like both in the, um, in the entire scene as well as if we average this along the uh, along track or cross track direction. Um, and so by, by correcting these, uh, by modeling or fitting curves to these different uh, signals, we're able to remove them from the elevation or from the DEM. Um, and get a much more accurate product. Another uh, global product uh, similar to the SRTM is the Tandem X Global DEM. Tandem X, if you're not familiar with it, is a pair of twin X-band SAR satellites uh, that are operated by the German space agency, DLR. Uh, these are flown in a tandem orbit so they're flying very close to each other, not nearly as close as this image suggests, but fairly close. Um, and because they're being flown in these tandem orbits, they're able to generate high accuracy DEMs. This has resulted in a global product um, uh, that, has, that is available with 90 meters horizontal spacing. And at least in areas of low slopes, uh, the absolute height error uh, on a global scale is about one meter. Um, so it's a very, very accurate product um, that is currently available via the German Space Agency, DLR. Uh, so if you click the link here in the slides, that'll take you to the mission page for the Tandem X Global DEM, and you can sign up and download um, different tiles for your area of interest or even uh, for the entire globe if you so choose. Another uh, fantastic new data set, or relatively new data set, is the Arctic DEM. This was first released in 2016, and as of release 7 last year, we have more than 159 million square kilometers worth of DEMs, so covering the Arctic many times over, uh, which that 159 million square kilometers represents more than 260,000 DEMs. So it covers all of Earth north of about 60 degrees north. And actually, I think it goes a little bit further south than 60 degrees. Um, and you can see what the entire coverage looks like uh, in this image here. So these are available as two meter DEMs. They're generated primarily from Worldview and Digital Globe satellite images. And you can get them as both mosaics as well as individual strips. So you can use these to, to look at elevation um, either as a static thing or because the individual strips have dates associated with them, you can use them for change analysis. These are available from the Polar Geospatial Center at the University of Minnesota, and they were recently ingested into Google Earth Engine, so you can also use them there. And there are more releases coming because there are still some gaps uh, that you can maybe see here in parts of, for example, um, northern Russia and Scandinavia. But the, uh, the work is ongoing and planned to continue um, as long as they keep getting images to, to process. 
these are not the only global or semi-global products that you can go out and find. Um, there's also something called the Aster Global DEM or Aster GDEM. Uh, most recent version is version 3, and you can see what that looks like here. Um, this is available at a global resolution of 30 meters, um, and it's fairly accurate um, over most areas, although areas where we have lots of clouds or lots of um, highly reflective surfaces, like over glaciers and ice sheets, uh, it might have more significant errors. Um, so something to, to be careful of if you're using the GDEM. Uh, there's also something called the NASA DEM or NASA DEM. Um, this is a combination of the SRTM data and other data sets to provide a global product. So remember that the uh, SRTM goes from the southern tip of South America up to uh, about 60 degrees north. So the uh, NASA DEM is intended to fill in the, the gaps where the SRTM doesn't have uh, data. We can also use archived air photos, much like we did with the, uh, with the practical from last week. Um, there's lots of different examples. USGS has lots and lots of images that you can go through and process for different areas, um, as well as other national uh, sort of survey, um, survey agencies like the, uh, the Ordnance Survey here in the UK. Uh, that you can go and get uh, archived air photos from. There's also declassified spy photos uh, from the US government. So in the 60s and 70s, there were a number of different programs that were acquiring fairly high resolution images over most of the Earth's surface. Uh, these were declassified in the 1990s and early 2000s. And as a result of that, we have a enormous archive of data um, that we can use to look at elevation changes over longer periods of time. Um, you can also find national level DEMs. Um, for example, the Ordnance Survey uh, in the UK has a national DEM that you can go and access. Um, similar products exist for the US, for Canada, Norway, Sweden, I'm sure lots of others, but those are at least the ones that I'm familiar with. You can go out and acquire your own DEMs through field work, as we've discussed a bit during the previous uh, lectures on photogrammetry. And there's lots of other sources. This is not exhaustive. Um, and most of these are either freely available or they're mostly free. For example, the declassified spy photos, you might have to pay, uh, I think it's $30 US for each individual photo, uh, which considering the um, Considering the potential or considering the, the value of these different DEM, these different photos, that's actually um, fairly reasonable. Okay, to sum all of this up, there is an unbelievable amount of data that is freely available or mostly free. I can't stress this enough. This is, this is such a huge change over the last few years uh, as to how much data is available for all sorts of different applications because we can find or process ourselves high resolution, highly accurate elevation models for almost anywhere on Earth. And as we are, as, as different uh, agencies are processing more and more data, we're filling in what, what few gaps remain. So this is an incredible, incredible time to be doing anything with elevation. Um, and in addition to all of the data that's available for more recent times, we also have lots of archived images that provide the potential for even more data. So that is it for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting and useful, and if you have any questions, please post them in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Thanks. Bye.